our next presenter uh, is going to share her story and how she got started. She's got a lot of experience with uh, running companies like Referly and Twilio. She's now the co-founder and CEO of Mattermark. Are we ready to get to make it get pretty loud here? Okay, let's hear it for Daniel Morel. Danielle Morel. Morel. Did I say it right? You got it. Hello. It's. Let me try that again. And you guys need to try it again too. Danielle okay. Morel. You got it. There we go. Excellent. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hello. I heard it was one more till lunch, so um, you know if you need to like stand up and stretch. I feel like a stand-up comedian whenever they give me a water bottle. So I'm gonna you know do that thing they do at the beginning, where uh, I take a sip and buy some time. Hello. This is awesome. This is so intimate. I can even see those of you back at the bar on your phones. How's it going? Awesome. So um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about how I got started with my company, Mattermark. And um, hopefully it'll just be a little startup story time for you. So it all began in April of 2013. I uh, wrote a blog post and I pissed off a bunch of people. I called all the VCs that were taking meetings with startups zombies because they are, and they're wasting startups' time. So I wrote a blog post, and I said, OK, I'm going to go on Crunchbase, and I'm going to find all the investors who have not done a deal in six months, but I know are meeting with my friends who are trying to raise a Series A. And I did this because somebody in a bar told me that they went and met with a VC, third meeting, desperately trying to raise money, almost out of money. And this guy was just like, yeah, you know, come back to me when you have more dot, dot, dot. I'm sure you've heard that before. And uh, he asked them, do you even do Series A? When was your last investment? And the guy literally shouted him out of the room. So I thought that was totally bullshit. Why was no one writing about that? Why wasn't that story in TechCrunch? So I wrote about it. And then I started thinking, man, my startup is not doing very well. I was running Referly at the time. And that blog post just did more traffic than my entire website for the whole month. Maybe I should work on this instead. And being in San Francisco, I thought it would be kind of fun to publish stuff people were talking about in the bars. You know, Valley Wag, anyone used to read Valley Wag when it was regularly published? I kind of secretly loved that. I don't want to admit to that too loud, but there's not too many people here, so I feel like maybe I'm safe. But, you know, if they were to bring it back, that would be okay with me. But um, really, the innovator here is this guy. Some of you probably don't know who this is. Pop quiz. This guy broke some pretty amazing stories. RIP good times. Thank you. I'm gonna get rid of the water. All right, no more of that terrible sound. RIP good times. We've got, uh, does anyone remember that? This is when Sequoia sent out a deck saying, you know, companies either need to get funded or sold because the economy's about to crash. Bin 38, also known as Angelgate. This is when a bunch of investors got together at a restaurant in San Francisco and colluded around how to, or allegedly colluded around how to keep valuations low. And you know, the startup color. You guys might have read about them. And tons of other stories. So Michael Arrington was writing about stories in TechCrunch that were pretty controversial. And after he stopped writing, frankly, the controversial journalism kind of ended. So now, you know, TechCrunch and a lot of these other publications are just kind of PR mouthpieces for startups. It's pretty boring, frankly. So I'm really interested in data because I feel like I'm never going to have all the insider information. I'm never going to suddenly make each one of you my source. That would be cool. We'd have a lot of ear. But it's just not efficient. But what I do have is access to data. When we started out, we took data from Crunchbase, which is this wiki site that's run by TechCrunch, and we did our initial analysis. And we got ripped apart. The data quality was just not there. And it turns out, as I started to do more research, that a lot of the data that I wanted, you can't even get it. You can't get a list of all the startups. Did you know you can't actually get a list of all the companies in the world either? You can't get a list of all the companies in the world. You can go to your chamber of commerce in your city, and you can probably get a list of all the companies registered in your city. But you can't get one big unified list of all the companies. So data is really powerful because it's a lot different than working with sources or anecdotes. So you guys might have heard about the Series A crunch. I think part of what I wanted to share with you are a couple interesting tidbits around the fundraising environment. So people have been saying, OK, there's this Series A crunch going on where there are way too many seed stage companies, 
and everybody's getting funded. And sometimes data does support these hunches. So this is an example of year over year, the percentage of seed stage companies funded that year that graduated to Series A. Going down pretty dramatically. If you're trying to raise your Series A, it's 3x harder. So other times, data can take commonly held hunches and kind of blow them up, which is my favorite, personally. So this is an annoying one I hear all the time. Seed funding is just crazy right now. Everybody's FART app is getting funded. Everybody's moving west you know, to get their company funded. Seed funding is down very dramatically off of a peak that took place two years ago. So it's like we feel the sense of one thing. Maybe like our friends are moving west from after school or you know, our local network of people happen to be doing something, but that doesn't mean that's what's happening in the whole world. And journalists' job is to help us understand the broader world. And data is one way to do that. And these are just pretty like fun, niche startup questions. These aren't even like the really hard-hitting business questions. These are just the tip of the iceberg. So the really cool discovery in all of this, first with that one blog post that got more traffic than our whole website, but then as we continue to write, was people were really hungry for these kinds of articles. I notice I've got some of your attention. I think you might be hungry for them too. I think smart people want to use data to better understand the world. We spend our jobs doing that. We use data in our work every day. We spend more than half of our lives working, probably even more than that now, with phones. So it's really hard to get the data you need, not just to an analyze startups, but to analyze businesses in general. So, you know, if you go, you can do this right now. I love play Stump Google is kind of my favorite game right now. Google results for which startups raised venture capital in 2014. There's over 3 million results. And none of these in the top are a list. If I go over to news, there are 142,000 results. So if I'm an analyst and a venture firm or anyone else who wants to answer this question, it's basically Google on this screen. Excel on that screen, and I'm doing it by hand. So let's try another business question. Pretty typical, right? So if you have a startup, you're probably trying to figure out what's the market size for your startup? I mean, who here, everyone's gotten that pushback. Your market's too small. So if we try to ask Google, what's the market size for SaaS? We do actually get numbers in this case. A lot of numbers. And a lot of expensive sources. So if you were to click through on these articles, you can't actually get to the underlying data. What you get to is a paywall to pay Gartner $50,000. It's just not something that the low-level person at a, at a firm just starting their job or, frankly, anyone who works in a company with any kind of procurement process is going to do. It's just a, it blocks you from answering the question. And the worst thing is that was just your first question. Usually, when you have a question in business, you answer that question, and then that begets another question and another question. And you finally get to the thing you're trying to decide. What vendor should I work with? Who should I sell to? Who should I hire? What market should I enter? And that's so far down the chain of questions that you ask that we never even get there. You don't ask Google, what market should I enter? You just don't ask, because you never get, get there in the line of thinking. You go somewhere else, and it's all locked up in spreadsheets. So why are spreadsheets so bad. They're not really bad, right? They're amazing. They're so powerful. We all can basically code in a spreadsheet. Like, even if you're not a software engineer, you can organize data in a way that you can share it, manipulate it, communicate it. So what's so wrong with this? Well, say that I'm an associate at Greylock, and I need to know about all the consumer internet deals that happened last year. And I make a spreadsheet. How many other people made the exact same spreadsheet? How stupid is that? That is so stupid. You are making spreadsheets. Like, even inside your own company, you probably have multiple versions of the truth, multiple versions of who your customers are, multiple versions of your financials, and it's even worse at a global scale. This is just nuts that we do this in this modern age. And the reason this is so stupid is because our time is precious. That's the whole reason why you should care, because I want to go home at 5, and actually do my job. And most people don't. They have to make up and basically be little human APIs for all the apps we haven't built yet on all the business data that we don't have because we didn't build 
search for business people. And that's what we're trying to fix. So something is wrong in the world. And Mattermark started out just focused on being a media company. We wanted to write blog posts. Frankly, I would love to write blog posts my whole life. When I retire someday, and I'm old, and I still love tech, and probably a lot of other stuff, I'm planning to write my whole life. But it's really frustrating how much time you don't spend actually writing. You just spend collecting and organizing all that data. So this is really crazy, right? We started out thinking, let's build this low margin, small market, niche business, because we pissed some people off. And somehow, by building the product that solves for some of those questions, we discovered that there's this much bigger problem. By the way, we raised some money. It was really hard. It was really hard. We raised $5 million in notes that where no note was larger than half a million dollars. I have 160 investors. People thought what we were building in the beginning was way too small. And frankly, we kind of believed them. But then when we started to actually solve the problem for customers, and they said, OK, you've answered this question and this question, so I'm two questions in, but I can't get to the next one. We'd be like, oh, we can help you with that. And we'd go help them answer the next question. And pretty much all I'm going to be doing the rest of my life until I become that writer that I mentioned is I'm going to organize all the world's business information. And I feel really crazy saying that. But I feel really great because we're already doing it. And so the reason I wanted to tell the story right before lunch is you might be working on something. You might think it's small. Maybe it's small right now. But what is the next adjacent question that your business answers? Because I'm pretty sure that a lot of us will end up working together. A lot of the data you need, I have. A lot of the products you make, I use. So that's the story of Mattermark in a nutshell. Um, and I have a lot of time left. I don't know if I talked really fast. But I'm going to take a sip of this water, and I would love to answer any questions. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, so, um, and I'll mention a few more. So there's also Hoover's done in Bradstreet, right? Like there's so many of these sites that track business information. So I would really love it if all the data that I needed was already available. So I would say from a data collection standpoint, we will buy whatever we can and we'll have to build the rest. Um, the real value is in workflow. The real value is in taking people through a process. So if you're a salesperson, you need to make sure that you drive someone getting on the phone with a prospect that's valuable to them. If you're an investor, you need to make sure you're taking meetings with the right people that you would actually want to invest in. If you're a management consultant, you want to make sure you're doing the right market sector research and that you have access to the right data. So I would say to the extent we have to fill the gaps with data that doesn't exist or isn't well organized, we're going to do that. Um, ultimately, we'd love to partner with a lot of the people that you mentioned. Um, but the long-term vision is really to build the workflow around getting you to come back and keep asking the questions over and over again. I think that answers both of your questions, but if not, I'm sorry. Yes? Hello. Good to see you. Yeah, so it's tough, right? I think that there will be some changes. I think there already are some changes that come from more data being more broadly shared. I hope a couple things happen. One, I hope investors across the board become more sophisticated. I think that would be good for startups and good for investors. But I think we don't believe that you would just invest with data alone. We think that it's a good jumping off point for qualifying, kind of like qualifying prospects in sales where you'd say, I don't want to talk to a company less than 100 employees or not in my geography. 
But it still does come down to relationship. Actually, in all of these transactions that we're going to make easier, it still will come down to human beings being good at connecting with each other. So I think that's probably where investors, I think they already differentiate there quite a bit, and I think that will just become even deeper um, as information becomes more flat. Yes? Yes, and I, I appreciate you asking me because I didn't want you guys to feel like you were being pitched a product too much, but just the quick version is we have a SaaS product that you log into on the web. It looks a lot like a um, Excel spreadsheet. It's dynamic, so you can filter it on the fly. So you could say, show me all the companies who've raised money in the last 18 months that are based in Las Vegas that have at least 50 employees and are growing web traffic at least 2% month over month. You could ask that kind of question and get back a list. Um, I'm sorry? Not yet. So right now you would apply a bunch of fi faceted filters. We also have an API, so you could actually take our data and ingest it into your own workflow. So if you had a CRM system or some kind of internal software and you had software engineers who wanted to integrate Mattermark's data, you could do that. And I should mention we have a free mobile app for iOS right now that you can download that lets you look up any company and get a lot of these facts kind of on a one-off basis. Um, so those are the three ways that we are available to customers right now. You're welcome. Yes? Cool, I'm gonna rephrase your question, just make sure I understood it. So how, what advice do you give people with big ambitious dreams, like being the next Bill Gates or the next Steve Jobs in a, in a markets where they're very competitive and it seems like you won't be. I mean, I think frankly, you need to build something that puts you above reproach. Like I don't think, it ma like the blog post that pissed people off is great, but if we just stopped there, that wasn't really enough. That wasn't a product, it wasn't, good enough, but I think pissing people off is just like, if you do anything worthwhile, you're going to piss people off. Um, so I think my advice would just be build something valuable, solve problems for other people, and tell everyone else to fuck off, frankly. Yes? Awesome. Yeah, you know, Bloomberg was one of our first customers, actually. So their question was, we want to find future founders, people who haven't started a company yet, but might. And could we use data to track those people down? So I think I hate competing, right? Because if you compete, then you spend a lot of resources just doing something someone's already doing. I like to find a way to do something different. I would say, I'm going to find a way to make every one of those companies a customer. I'm going to find a way to answer some burning question they have and create so much value that you know, data is a race to the bottom. Data wants to be free. That's why, to this other gentleman's question, it's only so much work you can do to collect and organize data. Because ultimately, that's going to be completely commoditized. So I'd be thinking, how do I build some very valuable workflow for the feature of those guys? And you know, competing on workflow is quite honorable. I'd say whoever builds the best solution for customers deserves to win. So that's how we'll approach that. Yes? Great question. So the question, oh no, <laughs> it's nice to meet you. <laughs> um, so the question was, how can founders use Mattermark to help them? So first of all, we give founders very, very discounted access, and it's free for you know when you're early stage and just getting started. A couple things I would do. One is I would look at which investors are actively investing 
at your stage and in your space. So there's an interface you can go into that shows all of the investors. And you could say, show me all the investors who've done a deal, let's see, in the past six months, uh, in let's say your startup is in, in like hardware infrastructure, whatever the category is. Um, and maybe even go a little bit deeper and say, and they invest in my geo. So making sure that they're not just Bay Area centric, that they're investing elsewhere would be valuable. And I would say that's a good target list. Working with people who are active is usually a good idea. Um, especially at the early stage where you've got these angel investors who can hop in and out of the market. Um, and the other one would be researching your first 100 customers. So if you have a pretty good idea of what your ideal customer looks like, this is a little more on the B2B side, you could certainly go and say, you know, we want to sell the companies that are in SaaS, so they have a SaaS sales team. They're at least 20 people, so they're starting to ramp a little bit, and they've raised at least $5 million so we can, they, they can pay for our product. And you could use that as a prospecting list. So that's two ideas for you. Good luck. I have two minutes and 23 seconds remaining. <laughs> hi. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I have a lot of investors, like I said. Yeah, so the question is, do we do anything predictive? Might we do something predictive in the future, given we have all this fast historical data? So at least right now, the internal phrase we use is describing the world as it is is hard enough. Because I don't know if you've ever talked about or read about this idea that you've got two eyewitnesses at a car crash. And they both go to, up to the police officer, and the officer says, what do you see? And the first one says, it was his fault. He was going too fast. And the other guy says, no, it was his fault. His brake lights were out. Like, they both saw the same thing, but they took away two different things. So I'd say challenge number one is definitely just make sure we can present the world as it is. Um, I actually don't believe that you can predict a lot of things. Um, I tend to believe Warren Buffett's view is correct, that like if you had a crystal ball, I'd, already, I'd start a fund, and I wouldn't bother building software. So I think what we'll do is we'll help people who do believe that there's a predictive capability feed the best possible data into their models and support them in doing that. But I think we'll continue to focus mostly on just the organization and part. I think it's a pretty big intractable problem at the moment that we're going to have to tie down. So great question, though. We battle that all the time. Yes? Yes? for tracking your, your own company's analytics. Um, I can tell you a few things I'm playing with right now. I'm playing with Domo as a central repository for everything. It's pretty pricey, but at a certain point, it's valuable. Um, I tend to adopt SaaS products that have good dashboarding. So Zenefits, for example, on the HR side, HubSpot on the marketing side. We're using Base for CRMs. But that is a huge problem for me, too. Everything has its own dashboard. It's not all necessarily combined together. Unfortunately, I still do combine a lot of this in spreadsheets, and I am kind of looking for the holy grail. So Domo is the closest that I've come so far. I think I have time for one more.
Well, I mean, I think open innovation doesn't actually promise that you won't exist in a competitive market. I, I guess I'm not totally sure what the question is. I'll try to rephrase it back to you just to make sure I got it, which is how, what advice do I have for a founder about what their future looks like in increasingly competitive markets where technology gives people so much leverage that it can feel like your competitor is, is way too far out ahead of you and there's no way to catch up? Is that accurate? Is that the question you're asking? Oh, okay, so how to get into... I mean, if I'm really blunt, I think you're way too focused on what other people are doing. Like, the hardest thing is startups just commit suicide. They just don't work out for, like, reasons that have nothing to do with other people. So I would say once you've built something, and maybe you have and you have customers, like, just take care of them and create value for them and be different in some way that makes them want to work with you above everyone else. I don't think that you need, or any of us need to worry about macro trends. Like I put some macro slides up there, but it doesn't really matter. For you day to day, I think what really just matters is creating something really valuable. If you do that, I think a lot of these other questions, they do matter, but not at the early stage, and they can take up an incredible amount of your precious time and energy. So my recommendation to you would be just totally focus on what you build and your customers and how to make them happy, and don't overly focus on, on the competitive market. I think maybe we should take this conversation offline because I don't think I can answer your question in the time that I have left. But I'm happy to chat with you afterwards. I think that's all the time I have, and I believe you guys are probably pretty hungry for lunch. So thank you for sticking around and learning about my company. Have a great time. All right. Thank you. Danielle, thank you so much.